Hello, everyone. The sign now said webinar has started and web and recording is in progress. So we will get started. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us live. Thank you, everybody, who's going to be joining us later on. Uh, I think we're going to have a lot of fun here today. Uh, you know, a brief introduction. Most of my panelists today really need no introduction. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Ellie Choi, who's an associate consultant in uh, the National University Hospital in Singapore. Uh, she is super awesome, and we're going to get really some great perspective from her. We've got Dr. Justin Koh, who is the clinical professor and chief of medical dermatology at Stanford, who also pretty much needs no introduction, and I'm really excited to get some insights from him. We've got uh, Dr. Jules Lepoff, who is an uh, assistant professor at Penn, uh, and also a uh, super prolific uh, writer and author and publisher of lots of different um, articles uh, from everything from uh, teledermatology to AI to all sorts of uh, you know clinically relevant topics. Uh, Dr. John Paoli, who's head of the Department of Dermatology and Venereology uh, in, uh, at the uh, University of Gothenburg in Sweden, uh, who again is also one of our uh, editorial board members at JAD International uh, and also really a tremendous, uh, tremendous expert in this field and just a really great guy. And finally, we've got Dr. Evgeny Semenov, who is an assistant professor at Mass General, who also has a ton of experience uh, in AI, also in teledermatology, and really excited to get everyone's perspective. And I'm really excited because this is such a you know relevant, exciting, and vibrant area right now uh, in dermatology. So what we're going to do, just so you have a brief structure, is I'm going to start off Dr. Co is going to give us a brief introduction to AI and dermatology. Uh, you know, a lot of people were kind of introduced um, to the possibility of AI by one of Dr. Ko's uh, papers a few years back. Uh, so uh, it'll be very interesting to hear his perspective on this. We'll then have a discussion around that. Uh, we're then going to pivot to talking a little bit more about teledermatology, uh, and we'll uh, have a uh, presentation there uh, by Dr. Semenov, as well as a pr presentation by Dr. Lipoff. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm really, really excited about all of this. Uh, and without further ado, though, so that we can get right into the meat of things, uh, we'll start and uh, Dr. Ko is going to go ahead and uh, take it away. And Jules, we do not have audio, I believe. All right. Uh, thanks, Jonathan, for the introduction and thanks for the, the hint about the audio. Uh, really exciting to be able to join everyone and, and thanks for joining in your interest in, in this topic. I think it's such an important and relevant one and, and, and certainly will influence the future of our field. Um, so I'm going to give a very, very brief overview of, of um, uh, augmented and artificial intelligence and dermatology. And you know, kind of part of this is where did we start? You know, about five years ago, John uh, Jonathan alluded to a spark of insight that my colleague Dr. Navoa had that hey, you know, the AI stuff that that's classifying dogs. What if we uh, brought it into our field? And it created this this just this set of breath, breathless pronouncements that heralded the the eradication of entire fields of medicine like ours, right? And and this was the time of literal, if you know, a literal, I, I didn't get a literal uh, uh, tomato, but figurative email sort of equivalence of, of that. Um, and, and I think this was really, um, it was really kind of a, a, a hype situation. And, and there's this thing called the Gardner hype cycle. And, and if we think about this, this can be applied to actually most technologies. This was really the peak of inflated expectations where people really made that leap and said, hey, that thing that you just did, it's going to blow things up. Um, and so this is where we are today. This slide is, I, I, didn't, I didn't fall asleep making this slide. We don't have any FDA approved um, models and systems in, in, in dermatology uh, as of yet. There are many that are in flight and knocking on the door and lots of great activity, but, but this is absolutely accurate here. So, you know, what, what happened? So I think what happened is, boy, we've gone down that slide from that peak of inflated expectations to that trough of disillusionment. And I would say appropriately so. This is a great development and, and great, uh, great thing to have happen. Um, and so this, this is how I see it. You know, we, we have this castle in the clouds. Everybody sort of has a potential of, of you know, what, what can we do and what's achievable and what's possible. But you know what? It takes a lot to build that ladder to this cloud, right? There is this chasm between possibility and, and, and sort of the, the promise and, and the reality and, and what it takes to get there. And I think we're all, um, you know, in this journey together where we're um, understanding the issues. We're starting to grapple with the issues. We're laying that foundation brick by brick, and we will get here. I think we'll get here for, for the better, but, but it's, not, it's not something that, that happens with a snap of the finger. 
and and our academy, our uh, this uh, U.S. based view here, our AAD Academy, um, was pretty prescient in in saying, hey, we've got to get in front of this and be involved in this and um, creating and putting out this position statement. And this is the the line in it that I like best. Really, the key to realizing the promise is to ensure that the technology is collaboratively developed. And it's designed for the benefits of our patients, physicians, and healthcare systems at large. And also recognizing that, boy, we got to minimize the risk of disruptive effects and unintended consequences. So it's kind of you know realizing what it is that we should be building for, and also what are some of the pitfalls. Um, I'm going to skip this here, um, but it's interesting that a lot of the activity in in this space has really been around kind of skin lesion classification, and it's not a surprise because that's where a lot of the data resides. Um, and so there's this concept where it's it's almost that, you know, people are looking for data to be able to build models and that's a backwards view in my opinion, right? So the building of models doesn't necessarily translate into clinical, clinical benefit or, or, or improvements in clinical care. Um, I think the opposite approach is absolutely needed. We need to figure out and, and as clinicians, as the experts, the domain experts, what are the problems that we need to be um, uh, solve? What, what should we be doing better? How can we augment our capabilities? And I'm sitting here this morning, I'm, I'm trying to feel peppy. I've got a lot of coffee, but I feel like this most days, and I don't know about you guys, but um, there is so much burden in being a clinician these days. And so I think this is where AI really uh, can play a role and, and augment our capabilities, right? This is the other way I feel probably when I open my Epic in basket uh, later on this morning. Um, and so what if we had, and what if we were to uh, what if we were to, to support and, and promote the, the development of AI capabilities to help and augment what it is that we do so that we can do less of the things that we don't need to do and, and don't enjoy doing, frankly, and do more of the things that patients value um, and that we value and that brings professional fulfillment and that increases the, the, the quality and experience of the care. It's different than classifying skin lesions. These are different problems, different issues, but if we're not involved, these things aren't gonna get looked at or, or done. So that's a little bit of my call to action as to why it's important for us. Um, so uh, I mentioned that trough of disillusionment is where we are. How do we get to this, you know, this plateau of productivity stage? Um, I think we fundamentally have to address you know, a, a number of issues and it's great that we can clearly see what those issues are. And I'm just going to go really high level two minutes um, uh, about what I think those are. One is data quality, right? All of this is founded and, and based on, on data. And so we have some problems with data in, in, in our field, one, one, you know, many problems. One, one is we have inconsistent data, right? So it's, it's in our daily work of clinical care, the generation of data, of Im images, of data quality. Think about your notes. Think about your images. You know, that, that's really the foundation of, of, of AI. And, and sort of we know the heterogeneity and, and histopathology as a, as a gold standard, there are some challenges there. There are also challenges related to data. When I think about it, I also think about missing data, right? Um, and Jules has written a lot about this. The inequities inherent in the care that we deliver and how we deliver care means that the patients we take care of who's represented in the data is not representative of our communities at large. And that is a huge problem because um, AI is, is, is not just a mirror that we hold ourselves up to, it's actually an amplifying force. So whatever, whatever inequities, whatever issues, biases exist, it makes it multi multitudes worse. And so we really have to be intentional about how are we gonna address this? How are we gonna fix this? Lots of really creative work and solutions here. And then there's privacy issues. There's how do we think about data and talk about data with our patients, with clinicians? Lots of bad things have happened in this space, right? And you can imagine lots of, um, uh, you know, lot, lots of uh, uh, sort of um, big companies, lots of efforts, and things go wrong if we don't really prioritize and think about how do we put our patients first. And then the last thing I'll, I'll show you, this is kind of um, when we develop models, we develop them, they really do well in the environment in which we're, they're developed. So right now, when we do sort of these in silico models, uh, essentially taking really cleaned up data sets and trying to train them, our models do great. Their curves look like this, they're almost perfect, right? This guy in the suit looks like Jules, perfect, right? But if you take this um, model and you put it into a different environment, right? You take that MGH data uh, uh, model and you put it into the Stanford environment, it's gonna look like this, right? So it's, it, it doesn't translate. It's not generalizable. These models are brittle. That's a big, big problem, right? So we got to figure that out too. 
Um, I'm going to end with just two other things that I think are just these unintended consequences. Let's learn a couple of lessons that are pretty, that weigh heavily in society's mind and probably in medicine's mind. One is social media, right? Social media was never developed to have these kinds of consequences, but here we are. And we have changed the world, I would say, for the worst, probably. I've got um, kids who are entering the world of social media, and boy, I wish it didn't exist. So this is something where if we don't think proactively before we develop this and as we develop this, we may end up in this situation with AI and augmented intelligence. And then this one hits close to home. Boy, we as clinicians were not involved and poorly involved in the development and, and, and design of EHR, and we're suffering for it. There's a whole industry that is, um, uh, that is uh, created in order to address the problems with EHR that was developed, right? The whole scribing industry. That's come about because this, this, this is not right. So um, we really need to be involved and, and really look forward to the discussion about um, how, we as a, how we as a clinical society and, and as a specialty um, can do more and do, do better and really push this in the direction of, of good. Well, wonderful. That was fantastic. Uh, you know, and I'm not going to have, um, you, you know, you and Yevgeny fight out which guy was the Stanford guy and which guy <laughs> was the MGH guy. Um, so I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll let you guys kind of work that one out uh, later on. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it, I think you raised a lot. Thank you so much for that, because I think you raised a lot of kind of key questions and the kind of the big, the meta issues um, going forward, uh, you know, which I, I think are so important. And, you know, you touched on unintended consequences. I'm going to talk more about this when we talk about teledermatology as well. I think it is so important to address that because, you know, as you allude to, uh, with social media, everyone said we're going to change the world. Um, and uh, yes, uh, you did change the world. But, you know, I think I don't remember who said it, basically, but they're like, you know, essentially, they're like 10,000 years of, you know, human development and insight, it, like, you know, is now, you know, gone in a span of a couple of years. Um, you know, the ability to kind of think about a question, see multiple sides, discuss it, you know, have a, you know, a debate where it's civil, where we can kind of diff have different opinions, but we can understand the other person is not the devil and we are not an angel and when we have those discussions so i think that you know the potential for amplifying those changes um, that you know that that feedback loop um, that we're really seeing now uh, i think uh you know i think is uh you know is a very powerful and very very you know important um you know important issue uh you know and i, I don't know you know it, it's interesting because you also mentioned how you know how this is going to function, um, you know, in 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 you know in different environments from a uh, you know surveillance capitalism standpoint, right? Um, and I think you know we're we're kind of spaced broadly geographically. Ellie, uh, you know, of course, you're you're over in Singapore, um, you know, which um, you know is famous for um, having much more efficient um, surveillance things in some ways in a good way. By the way, I will tell you when I was at the I, I spoke at like a regional uh, Durham conference there a few years back. I thought it was amazing. I'm like everybody, no one is speeding. Like this is you know like this is you know you know, fantastic. So, I mean, obviously there are, you know, there are plus sides, um, you know, to having that. Uh, but, um, you know, I, I think there is a lot of variability in the way people respond and, and the way people, you know, can, can kind of deal with that. Um, you know, what would you say, I'm going to kind of go around and ask people one thing that they think is maybe overhyped um, in the field of AI or augmented intelligence. Um, and, uh, uh, and we'll see kind of what people think and we'll see kind of if there are differences there. Uh, by the way, for people watching, I can see somebody's already asked a question uh, from India, which I'm going to um, get to in one second. Um, so feel free, by the way, people uh, throw questions in there. I'm going to try to get to everyone's question and comments. So please, please go ahead and do that in a question and answer thing for those watching, uh, for those watching live. For those who are watching afterwards, unfortunately, the technology is not there yet, um, but um, I'm sure some of the guys on this panel can uh, uh, can, can figure that out. Um, and maybe, uh, uh, you know, we can, uh, we can definitely... Uh, definitely work out something going forward. Uh, but anyway, so Ellie, what do you think? Um, you know, one thing overhyped um, in the field of AI augmented intelligence. Uh, what, what do you think about that? Yeah, so I think, you know, one thing was when it first came out, like Justin's paper, everyone was really excited about how AI and machine learning could, you know, accurately categorize conditions. And I think like a lot of points that Justin very accurately mentioned about how these things may not be generalizable to other contexts. And it performs more poorly in other settings. And I was also quite curious, you know, if Justin knows what are like the reasons why, you know, it hasn't been FDA approved and why actually is the uptake of these classification algorithms and programs so poor? Because I thought it would be faster because it does, does look like it will be helpful. Mm. Uh, so, so maybe I'll just jump in because this was going to be the point that I was going to say is overhyped and 
and I'm I'm gl I'm glad it's taking this long. I would have been very very concerned if it was hey something was approved in 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 a year, because doing this work and and actually all the folks on the on the panel know, it is it is it is not a an easy jump to go from model performance to clinical impact, and that's what I want to see. That's what I care about as a clinician, and and I know we all care about just because you got a model that says something. Let's just say you've got a great model and it works in in sort of real world settings, and it works across sort of diff uh, different environments. It's a lot of jumps already. There's still humans involved, right? Somebody's got to use, use the output and make a decision and change care. And we've got to see what kind of benefit or, or drawback that has. Same thing that we do for clinical trials, right? We got to, we got to see what is the clinical out, outcome of, of this. That's, that's what I want to see. And, and that's what I want to make sure is in place. And there's a whole thing that we haven't even talked about, which is, you know, an algorithm by itself, you need an ecosystem around it. These are almost like if we think about the ecosystem and the QI quality controls that we have around imaging and radiology and laboratory medicine, that's what we're going to need to develop, right? So when, when a lab a test um, goes off kilter, they know it immediately, right? Because they have robust QI systems that knows that things are usually within this band. If it's outside of this band, um, you know, let's shut it down and figure out what's wrong. We don't have that yet, but we need it, right? So how are we going to regulate and control and audit and create the systems that really make this safe and effective? Um, so that that's 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 where I think is a is a big big uh, area that we need to get to. Yeah, that's it. That's such a key point too. I think you both raised really you know kind of key areas because uh, one of the challenges um, that we have going forward also is that uh, and this touches really on what you were saying, Ellie, from a you know you know in terms of approving things and using them clinically and and really just on what you were talking about is that number one you've got the you know the problem of overfitting right the problem of generalizability. Number two, you've got the problem of the black box nature um, of some of the stuff here. So when you're when you're doing a lab test, right? If you if we want to make that analogy, we we know basically what. What's going on because we've designed the test to do that you know here we're looking for patterns and you know we didn't realize that the pattern was that the fact that the the ruler was in all the images of the uh, pigmented lesions that were concerning for melanoma uh, so we didn't we didn't realize that and that was a key thing we didn't understand so so i think you know you're really raising um some really um really uh really critical points um uh how about uh, uh jules uh, uh dr lipoff what, what what do you think about uh you know an, an overhyped area well first i just want to Thank you again for inviting me. It's really an honor to be among such esteemed colleagues and to participate in this and such an important conversation. Um, so yeah, I think when it comes to AI, the biggest hype to me was, will machine learning models replace doctors? And to me, and it, Justin touched on this, but clearly that's overhyped to me and that's not gonna be the issue. And there's a few different ways we can think about this. One in way Justin and the AAD task force have emphasized framing this as augmented intelligence rather than artificial. It's not meant to replace, it's to be a collaboration, a partnership. We don't need to create artificial dichotomies where it's man versus machine, where we've always worked together with technologies and we can make things more efficient. We can triage, we can do a lot of different things. It doesn't have to be replace us. And that actually, as uh, Eric Topol has written about this, that actually can humanize medicine by taking away some of the tedious tasks, maybe EHR, other things. It gives us more time to focus on the things that are innately human in our clinical care, to spend time talking to people, build relationships, because maybe some of those other tasks can be handled through more efficiency. Uh, but also the hype is being you know, that it can be replaced is also tainted by the fact that there's a lot of problems with the models, like the inequities and the poor representation. Uh, for instance, if you were to judge what all dermatologists look like by this panel, that would be not representing the majority, which are women, right? And so we need to make sure that our data uh, uh, reflects uh, accurately our populations, right? And so you know, garbage in, garbage out, as they say. So that's very important that even if theoretically it can work, we are dependent on how well we represent everything. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And the, uh, you know, what you raised about, you know, Eric Topol's work also, you know, kind of uh, the digital doctor, a number of other things, this more recent stuff uh, really focused on the patient uh, perspective is, I think really, you know, the other elephant in the room, which is, 
you know, we tend to, as dermatologists, we tend to think about, you know, AI from the perspective of, you know, uh, augmenting our experience, uh, but really what we need to be thinking about is more broadly, how is AI augmenting the patient's experience? Because uh, the, the, you know, and this is hopefully what we all really believe, the person who matters in the room is not us, it's the patient. So, you know, how do we kind of pivot that uh, and really, you know, help to make sure that that, you know, that that remains, uh, remains the focus. Uh, John, uh, any thoughts? Yeah, well, uh, thanks uh, for the invitation. And uh, I, I completely agree with everything that's been said so far, but uh, I'd like to just expand a little bit on, on, on the issue of, of data quality, but perhaps also data quantity. And I think uh, what's been overhyped is also the amount of data that we think that we have access to. And it's uh, not just bad, but it's also not that much. Um, if you look at the Isaac, uh, the, uh, which is probably the, the, the largest uh, online database of you know, quality images, the quality is not that great, and the quality of the annotated data is not uh, all that, um, uh, you know, uh, bountiful in, in terms of uh, of um, information. I mean, you have clinical images, you have you have dermoscopic images, and then you uh, look at the melanomas that they have, and we don't know what the Breslow thickness is. We don't know if they're in situ or, or invasive. Um, we just uh, collaborated with them and, and we're sending them 1,500 annotated images with Breslow thickness and they were, you know, overwhelmed by, oh my God, this is going to be our first 1,500 cases with, with that kind of data. Um, so, and, and, that, and it's, a tremendous, it's almost doubling the, the number of, of melanomas that they have, dermoscopic images of. So, I mean, it's really, really limited. We, we, we have just so little data. And then perhaps also, of course, um, I think m many people believe that, that we know what would what, what happen if we implement these systems in healthcare. There's basically no prospective studies uh, on what happens uh, with our management decisions when we implement uh, AI solutions in different situations. So I think this is, uh, yeah, the reason why we're in the, <laughs> at the bottom of your graph there, Justin, uh, unfortunately. Yeah, I, I think that's that's a really a tremendous point. Also, just in terms of the uh, you know the question of you know implementation and, and and management, because I think that does become a a you know a big challenge. You know, how do we? So let's say we have the data. Well, then you know, let's say we have this information. How do we use it? Uh, because I mean, you can look at this from the perspective of I mean, we haven't even agreed on whether it makes sense for us to have uh, melanoma screenings, right? There's an active debate in the dermatology community um, about whether uh, you know screening the general population for uh, for melanoma makes sense. Uh, so uh, you know, we're sort of you know we we're, we're we're sort of running this horse like way down the road over there. Um, but meanwhile. In, in some ways, we're kind of back at the starting line. We haven't even kind of like gotten out of the gate yet. So uh, I think that's a, that's a tremendous point. Uh, Yevgeny, uh, go ahead. Hi, John. Uh, thanks again for your invitation to participate in this webinar. So I think there are two main issues that I think were very much overblown. The first one is the hype uh, or maybe really underestimating, and Justin alluded to this, how willing we as a society would be to accept black box algorithms. Um, I think that there's a genuine desire on the part of all of us to really understand what actually is happening. And what initial attempts at AI have done and are still to some extent doing is essentially offering these perfect solutions uh, that we ultimately don't fully understand. And then we uh, finally see fail when we transfer to a different setting. Um, and uh, I think now that there's a whole new field called XAI or explainable AI that is trying to undo some of uh, the initial damage done uh, by purely black box approaches to, um, to deploying models. The second part was a uh, over fascination, I think, of just imaging. I think that there's definitely a ro uh, room for imaging in augmented intelligence. Uh, and it may be very, very helpful from uh, clinical images to radiographic images to histopathologic images. But I think that that came out of uh, radiology essentially leading the way. And one has to be really careful about differentiating dermatology from radiology for many reasons. Uh, there's a lot of standardization for image intake in radiology that just simply does not happen with dermatology. We have no metadata for most of our images. Uh, there's uh, lighting differences can affect a lot of things. Uh, and it's so much more in involved. So I think that the hype of just going image, image, image analysis, and rather than focusing on precision medicine using clinical informatics and a process improvement, uh, as Justin alluded to, I think that's been missed and people are now turning their attention in that direction and really trying to refine processes and using uh, AI, whichever way you want to define it, to, to help improve those measures. 
Yeah, I think that's a great point. And I think, you know, kind of the elephant in the room that we haven't really alluded to specifically, although I think many of us have done work in this area, is uh, dermatopathology, right? Because, uh, you know, it's one thing, you know, again, I think we all do in the back of our head have the, uh, you know, have, have the radiology uh, example. Uh, and, uh, you know, in many ways, uh, Dermpath is much more um, uh, appropriate um, and, and still has many more challenges because the standardization of images, the amount of uh, the disk disconnect between uh, something normal and abnormal, the disconnect between the range of normal um, in a slide, uh, which depends on so many more factors than the range of normal on a chest radiograph, right? Uh, so it, it's, you know, it, it's, it's much more, uh, uh, you know, it, again, it's a much messier process, uh, but I think that's somewhere where, you know, in many ways, and I think, Evgeny, you and I, I think years ago, we were sitting at a JAD um, editorial board meeting uh, next to each other. Um, don't tell, Dirk, if you're watching, don't be upset at me, but we might have been chatting um, while you were speaking at some point. I don't know. Uh, but uh, we were uh, talking about precisely this issue, um, which was uh, kind of Dermpath AI um, related issues. So I think there's a lot um, out there. And I think there are a lot of different directions that things can go. So I think it's really interesting. I want to get to a question from the audience, uh, which is from um, Sanjana, uh, which is from, uh, so this, this question reads, hi, I am from India. Uh, since the advent of Bezonomics, um, thank you, Jeff Bezos. Um, what are the implications of AI and healthcare from Amazon's perspective in dermatology, especially in my country with a billion uh, people in the population. So, you know, kind of getting at the, uh, I think we, you know, briefly alluded to the question of the, uh, and, and Justin, you a slide about this, talking a little bit about the, uh, you know, techno capitalism, AI capitalism thing. What are going to be, and we have all been kind of lamenting, uh, you know, I've got my gray hair so I can lament uh, social media. Uh, you know, what, what, you know, what do we think, um, you know, in terms of, you know, implications uh, and particularly, and I, I think, you know, Sanjana, I think you raised an interesting point, um, which is uh, that again, Again, uh, you know, a lot of this stuff is kind of very based on uh, kind of a U.S. centric, where a lot of the development stuff is going on, and of course Sweden, where a lot of John's uh, important development work is going on. Um, but uh, you know, in terms of where, and that, of course, and you know, it's funny because we had this discussion at the JAD International uh, meeting um, about you know where articles are coming from, etc. And you know, part of the issue is funding, right? Because where's research funding coming from? Uh, you know, for the most part, um, you know, research funding is you know the bulk of research funding in the world. Is in the U.S. Um, and so, whether it is um, governmental investment in you know healthcare and science, basic science research, or whether it is corporate um, investment, uh, so how do these things connect? And maybe Jules, I'll go to you uh, with this question because you've written a lot um, about um, you know inequities and, and that kind of um, you know in, in that area. Uh, any thoughts um, that you have uh, on how that would fit in? Well, I think it's a it's a very large question. Uh, the economic impacts and and Bezos and Amazon and all these big companies, what they're trying to leverage and expand. Um, I think there's incredible opportunities, uh, you know, with technology, with AI, with telemedicine to level the playing field, uh, to better connect people and to resources that they don't have access to. Um, when you have large populations, say large rural populations or in the developing world, you know, there's not good access to a lot of uh, resources. So there's a lot of potential, but I also don't want things to be done without appropriate um, medical expertise, without, in, in, and especially some of these tech companies, you know, they don't really seem to have a lot of physician uh, involvement in the development. And, and so they're kind of doing it just because they think it can be done. Uh, I mean, some of it seems pretty obvious that there are issues if you, any of the, you know, Alexa or Siri, like uh, um, healthcare delivery, it, it's, it's clearly very rudimentary and not, not has a lot of problems, but, and it's not that that shouldn't be looked into perhaps, but I don't want, you know, our populations to be used as guinea pigs. I, I want us to make sure that we're always prioritizing quality uh, very high up. And so as exciting as this is, I, we can't let the you know cart get before the horse. Yeah, no, I think that's that's an important point. I mean, I think and I think that's 
uh, you know, the the uh, hype, um, you know, outpacing, um, you know, where we are with a lot of these things, I think is, um, you know, is an important thing, uh, you know, to be considering, um, you know, when we look at this, uh, you know, um, uh, Ellie, I know, uh, for example, um, there was a little bit of talk with this with the, uh, uh, with the JAD journals when uh, Google came out with uh, uh, talking about, um, you know, um, developing a new um, kind of automated um, skin color rating thing. And, but the, you know, the interesting part in that is that, you know, this was not, dermatology wasn't involved in this, right? Um, so, you know, I mean, what are, Ellie, what are your thoughts about the, you know, involvement of dermatologists in um, some of these uh, discussions and, you know, in some of these things, especially when you've got companies, for-profit companies um, that are uh, developing some of these technologies? I guess like what you're alluding to is probably very important to have an appropriate representation, not just of dermatologists, but of the different stakeholders, maybe even the patients and public as well. And this has to be representative of um, even minority populations, like patients of skin of color. So I guess it is important. And I'm, I'm not really sure what are the barriers, why they aren't, you know, happening as often as we wish that they were. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting because you raise the the you know in the in the UK, for example, um, studies don't just go through in like an IRB type thing, an ethics committee. They also go through PPI, which is a patient and public involvement, um, which is kind of an additional step we don't typically do in the US. Uh, but you know where it's kind of and and I mean those of you who've published like kind of like in BMJ journals, right? They have like you have to have like a paragraph on how the patients and public perspectives were incorporated and involved because there is this appreciation that you know again you know we're not just doing this for ourselves. Like, you know, we're, the whole point is that we're supposed to be delivering care to our patients. That's who really matters. Uh, you know, Justin, um, you're, you're kind of over in the, uh, in the, in the Google neighborhood there. Um, and any thoughts um, that you have about, about this? I'm, I'm a huge, huge proponent of, of clinician involvement in, in, in this work. And I think, you know, sometimes we think about um, uh, sort of cl clinicians, academicians, and, and companies, and, and have a little, oh, you know, the conflicts. No, I, I think for this, it's so crucial, and I would actually advocate that that we are are proactive in getting our voice out there because sometimes what happens is these companies they engage after they've developed the product that is like years late. It's actually in the thinking through of the issues, just the, like the one Sean is raising we have the expertise about, oh, why is that data set actually not, you know, what's the weakness of that? Why is it that the way that they labeled the data, what, you know, why can't we extrapolate that? These are things that only, only folks who are really deeply and, and, and steeply in, in, enmeshed in, in sort of the nuances and, and the, the, the details would, would understand. And so we need folks to, to be involved in those processes and, and those conversations and those efforts. And, and I think it, I think it will make a tremendous difference. And I think this is absolutely an area where, where it's, you know, I, I think the, the potential for clinician involvement in this is so, so great. And, and I think absolutely essential. And I just think back and, and wish um, predecessors in medicine had done the same with EHR development, right? We'd be in a very different place. Yeah, John, I think you had a, a comment on this. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I, I completely agree. And, and I, I might just want to comment on, on the challenge I think that we have with uh, interacting with huge companies like Google or Amazon or all of, all of the other tech companies. Uh, and the, exactly what, what has been described here by, by everyone in the group is, is that uh, we're going to be asking questions. We're going to be demanding, uh, you know, looking more closely at the data and, and all this. And that's a slow process. And tech, tech companies don't like slow people. So that's why we're not invited. That's why I think we're not being involved. It's because they know that we're going to slow things down. Yeah, that's a great that's my, that's a my great hypothesis, point. at least. I don't know if you guys agree. No, I think that's that's actually a great. I mean, that's a great pragmatic answer to the question, right? Because um, if you think about it, right, the tech companies in some ways are uh, right. Uh, you know, fail fast, right? And uh, uh, academics are not known uh, most, at least, are not known uh, for being super fast, and not known also for being. Uh, I mean, if we think about what gets popular on Twitter, right, it's going to be things that are extreme, things that are. You know, it's you're totally wrong. You're an angel. You're a demon. Uh, but you know, most of the world really. Really exists in the in-between places, uh, and that's uh, you know that's where that uh, that that uh, you know that 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 challenge really uh, comes in. Now, Evgeny, your thoughts? Yeah, I think we have to approach this very much like we approach clinical trials for pharmaceuticals. I mean, these are going to be deployable clinical products eventually. Um, hopefully, the FDA is going to approve some of these. 
And at this point, I think it's almost inconceivable that clinicians are not involved in the clinical trial process for uh, pharmacologic, uh, for medication. So, uh, I mean, because we need to phenotype, we need to observe uh, uh, side effects, uh, and there are going to be equivalencies to those in the augmented intelligence deployable products. So I, I think that that has to be uh, understood, and I think it's, it's going to be over time. Great, great. So what I'd like to do is I'm going to pivot us a little bit to talking about teledermatology. Hopefully we will, and by the way, for the audience, you're welcome to ask more questions about the augmented intelligence and the AI, et cetera, as well. I'm going to pivot a little bit to teledermatology so we can have a chance to talk about that too. Uh, and then we can potentially move back and forth uh, in terms of discussions. Um, so I'm going to uh, let uh, Evgeny go ahead and uh, do a, a brief presentation uh, on that. Can you guys see the presentation? Wonderful. So again, good morning and uh, thank you for allowing me to present uh, on the updates in teledermatology and for participation in this uh, JET International webinar uh, this morning. So I have no relevant financial disclosures. Um, as you're aware, teledermatology has gained increasing attention in the last decade and particularly over the last three years uh, in the setting of the global COVID-19 pandemic. This has exposed many patients and most dermatology providers uh, in the US to the important role of telemedicine in the provision of healthcare and catalyzed many investigations into its implementation, benefits, and challenges. One of the immediate benefits, of course, of this was uh, to improve provider and patient safety through a redu reduction in face-to-face -face interactions and therefore hopefully reduction in infectious disease transmission. But the benefits of telemedicine are actually much more far-reaching. Uh, for example, a recent economic evaluation of teledermatology care for chronic skin diseases estimated that a nationwide implementation of telehealth technology uh, for the treatment of moderate to severe psoriasis can lower medical costs by $1.5 billion, uh, save patients more than 67 million hours in work absenteeism and travel time, and save employers $1.2 billion. And this resulted in a net $4.3 billion uh, societal cost savings over the next five years in the US alone. And remember, this is just for psoriasis. So if you can imagine expanding this to other skin conditions, then the uh, cost savings to society and the individuals would be significantly larger. Also, telemedicine has the potential to improve longstanding problems in access to healthcare services and among dermatology services specifically, uh, which have been accentuated by overall insufficient number and uneven distribution of providers between metropolitan and rural settings. Uh, for example, nearly a quarter of uh, U.S. zip codes uh, have no practicing dermatologists, or 40% of all dermatologists in the U.S. practicing in 100 of the densest areas. In dermatology, we typically categorize telemedicine as asynchronous or synchronous, and in 2020, asynchronous encounters represented about 70% of all teledermatology services globally. Uh, this is typically provided uh, using store and forward consultations uh, in which patient information is transmitted to a dermatology provider from either a non-dermatology provider or directly from the patient. The dermatologist would then review this information and provide feedback to the originating party. And because this encounter is really not performed in a live fashion, uh, it is referred to asynchronous. Synchronous teledermatology, on the other hand, uh, includes live interactions, um, and uh, these are conducted in real time uh, via tele video teleconferencing or uh, could even be done using audio only tel teledermatology. Uh, but the latter is really not as ideal because um, uh, it's, really, <clears throat> it's, it's really only utilized uh, when patients don't have good access to photographs or video technology, and usually is going to be used um, in discussions of uh, test results or monitoring of response to treatment rather than to a, a new diagnosis or a new encounter. So the increasing use of teledermatology services has resulted in the creation of a position statement by the American Academy of Dermatology on minimum criteria for the provision of high quality telemedicine. Again, this is, these are guidelines. Um, not everything is uh, driven by the uh, uh, legislation around this necessarily, or even evidence-based, but uh, they're fairly sound. Uh, they include things like physicians must be uh, licensed in the state in which they provide uh, the telemedicine. Um, there should be um, uh, the choice for a patient to choose from among different providers who are uh, board certified in dermatology with easy access to provider credentials. Uh, there should be easy access to patients' medical history information, time of telemedicine encounter, as well as proper documentation of the encounter. Care coordination with referring providers uh, would be helpful and appropriate. 
and quality assurance programs need to be established for clinicians and organizations participating in cellular dermatology. Additionally, uh, there needs to be an opportunity or an ability to refer a patient to a local urgent care or emergency room when uh, the patient's needs require rapid in-person evaluation. And lastly, and this one is a little bit more controversial, but uh, there's a recommendation that if uh, live uh, teleconferencing is used in telemedicine, then there should be a pre-existing established relationship between the patient and the dermatologist uh, prior to providing the telemedicine services. And I know that this has been particularly more difficult, but it is one of the um, uh, criteria here. Uh, the reimbursement landscape in teledermatology is also currently in flux. Um, uh, all 50 states uh, and Washington, D.C. currently offer some form of Medicaid fee-for-service reimbursement for live video teledermatology. But only half of the states reimburse for store and forward, the asynchronous option I discussed earlier, and 29 states reimburse for audio only in some capacity, with only 13 states reimbursing for all of the telemedicine modalities I just kind of discussed earlier. This is complicated even further when considering private insurance reimbursement. Uh, currently, 43 states um, have a private payer law that addresses telehealth reimbursement, with only 21 states uh, requiring payment parity between in-person and telemedicine visits. There's also an unclear policy about applicability of out-of-network coverage when it comes to telemedicine. So the Telemedicine scope of practice and reimbursement policy we just discussed are currently in transition as many of these regulations have been relaxed during the recent COVID-19 public health emergency. Uh, but these provisions must be renewed every 90 days and are currently set to expire on July 15th, with, with 35 states set to end their COVID-19 PHE declarations in August. Since these renewals take place at both the federal and state levels, teledermatology provision and reimbursement policy is highly variable across from state to state and across time. Uh, we also um, saw in the previous slide that there are marked differences in insurance coverage for these services between public and private payers, and that uh, the differences in reimbursement for various telemedicine modalities are particularly strong, especially when comparing between um, store and, for and forward and audio only services, which tend to get much lower reimbursement than live teleconferencing. Also, um, while overall improvement in access to healthcare is a uh, goal here and can be reached, there are certain patient populations that are not likely to have as much advantage from teledermatology services. This includes older adults who are typically less familiar and comfortable with telehealth technology, as well as individuals with poor internet access and inability to provide high quality photographs. Uh, from another technical perspective, uh, there's a growing number of um, concern, I guess, about uh, patient data privacy and security of the increasing number of standalone teledermatology applications and platforms that are not HIPAA compliant. And lastly, uh, several attempts have been made uh, to provide uh, general guidelines for the provision of teledermatology services, like we discussed with the AAD consensus statement, but there's still a lack of specific guidelines for which patients are more appropriate for telehealth encounters, as well as guidance on how to effectively provide and assess provision of remote health care. So uh, despite these uh, challenges, teledermatology is here to stay. Uh, the global teledermatology market has already reached over $12 billion and is expected to increase fivefold over the next eight years. With this market growth, more and more organizations are going to be committing resources to supporting teledermatology services, including technology development to facilitate these encounters. For example, as uh, uh, Dr. Cole uh, discussed previously, um, uh, there are going to be applications of augmented intelligence, artificial intelligence, uh, that could be used in the image analysis component to actually help transform uh, images with poor quality, uh, maybe using generative adversarial networks or other uh, uh, AI approaches to maybe something that's a little bit more easy to interpret. Um, you could use that to standardize image intake, um, as well as uh, standardize lighting conditions of images that are transmitted by teledermatology and uh, potentially even help with some of the automated classification or almost pre-screening um, in a triage-based approach of teledermatology consultations. I'm happy to take any questions and thank you so much. Great, thank you. That was absolutely fantastic. Uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, you raised some really critical big picture issues um, in teledermatology and kind of really outline, um, you know, kind of the state of the art where we are right now. Um, so uh, pivoting then to think about, you know, beyond the US, right, because we've got, you know, a lot of data coming out, um, you know, in the US. 
Um, you know, Ellie, I know, you know, we've, we've published some stuff in JAD International recently about, um, you know, teledermatology, actually teledermatology in Singapore. Um, any thoughts um, from the perspective um, of being over in, in Singapore in terms of how you're using tele teledermatology, how patients are using it and how, how that's working out on a practical level? Yeah, so I think in Singapore, our needs are a little bit different because Singapore is very small and every Singaporean gets access to a subsidized uh, care under dermatologist as long as referred through a primary care provider. So access is not so much an issue, but a lot of it is more on improving the convenience for patients. Um, when you talk about funding in Singapore, telemedicine is funded the same way as an in-person consult. So the subsidies are exactly the same. And teleconsults are also charged exactly the same as a physical consult, which we know some patients have some um, issues about because innately some people think that it should be priced cheaper. Um, otherwise, for us in teledermatology, we did see a, a, a large increase during the COVID period, but that has also sort of tapered off, although now it's still at a level that was higher than pre-pandemic days. Interesting. John, uh, how about uh, the Swedish perspective? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's really interesting to hear uh, Jenny's uh, talk and then uh, Ellie's perspectives because, um, uh, and, and we also have a question in the Q&A that we'll perhaps get to later, but uh, applications of teledermatology vary so much between countries and also between regions. And uh, we have situations where people don't have access to dermatologists as, as Jenny was presenting. And then we have the issue in Singapore, which is quite similar to Sweden in, in one way. We have some people living in northern Sweden who have a long distance to uh, like 20, uh, 200 kilometers to, to the closest dermatologist. And then we have even use of teledermatology within uh, the city of Gothenburg, where it's just a 10 minute uh, bike ride to the hospital, basically. But uh, we're still using it for triage and for making, you know, melanomas get in quick and patients that have something that's, uh, you know, not uh, urgent, uh, they can wait. And we're, we're prioritizing patients and, and sending referrals back and giving uh, general uh, practitioners recommendations on how to manage their patients. So um, removing all the fluff, all the like 40, 50% of patients that don't really need to come to our dermatology department. So it's useful in so many different settings and so many different regions and everyone can find their way of applying teledermatology to, to increase the effectiveness of, of healthcare. And efficiency. Um, so that's the beauty, I think, of teledermatology. Then we also have the issues of uh, image quality. Uh, who's taking the images? Is the patient? Do they have access to cameras? If it's the GPs, do they have, um, you know, if it's tumors that I work with, uh, skin cancer um, referrals, do they have uh, good dermoscopy equipment? Uh, can they take good images? Can they standardize it? We have to provide feedback. We have to be uh, kind of uh, uh, proactive in, in, in uh, teaching them education. Um, and this is, you know, what's lacking. And then a lot of people give up along the way because they say, oh, well, images are bad. So let's just not do it and then just call the patients. It's easier. But we have to be, you know, really proactive and, and have more people engaged in this. And I think the, the, the number of, of participants using uh, or practitioners using uh, teledermatology in, in a more effective way grew during the pandemic. Um, perhaps not enough to solve all the problems, but at least some and the uh, acceptance rates. We saw this in, in a study from the International Dermoscopy Society that people were surveyed and, and uh, acceptance of, of teledermatology has grown quite a lot during the pandemic. So this is a good trend at least. Yeah, that's, that's super interesting, kind of getting that really international perspective and it touches on it. You mentioned one of the questions from Dr. Ohm was, um, you know, sort of, uh, you know, writing from India, you know, what is, you know, what are the best uses of teledermatology in, you know, for, you know, poor patients in rural areas where there really is this challenge of access, uh, you know, how do you implement it in an efficient way, in an equitable way, um, and in a way that's going to have the most impact? Um, uh, Jules, any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, so I think, one of my main areas of interest in research is improving access to care. And I see telemedicine as just another method of care. I don't like to compare telemedicine to in person. They both are more appropriate in different settings and different situations, not unlike um, AI versus human delivered care. Uh, I think that it's easy to forget how quickly technology has evolved such that now every single person in the world effectively has a cell phone. And so we can connect almost anyone with, uh, with each other. And there's the potential of better distrib distributing resources more equitably and to offer opportunities to those in rural areas. Now, 
I think during the pre-pandemic, as Eugenie was pointing out, you know, mostly our focus was on asynchronous telemedicine. And because of reimbursement incentives and being more like a normal visit, the push became a lot more for synchronous video visits during. And as great as those can be, I think they're incredibly inefficient and not a good use of time and actually have a lot more technology and other problems. And I would like to shift things back more asynchronously. I think there's a huge missed opportunity. One, we're not reimbursing it. Um, it's a lot more efficient. You can see a lot more people. Uh, and we're not even triaging people to which kind of visits they're most appropriate for very well. And I'd also like to mention uh, on this note that we've been talking about telemedicine, AI, social media, misinformation. These don't exist in isolation. Uh, these all intersect in interesting ways. Um, for instance, we did a study looking at Reddit forms of people trying to crowdsource their dermatology problems. So they're doing telemedicine through social media and maybe getting misinformation with it. And so it's really interesting. We're trying to meet patients where they are, what they're seeking. They're not feeling like they have access. Uh, how do we leverage technology? How can we use AI to potentially improve that? We used some AI to comb through uh, uh, Reddit forms in dermatology using uh, natural language processing just to get a sense of what people are talking about. And that was really interesting just to show, you know, what patients are actually doing. Like we found out they're using uh, dishwashing uh, soap for acne and other things uh, and decide, well, maybe there is something legit that we're just not giving enough research to. But also we tried another study in a test environment can we even deploy like benevolent bots to respond to misinformation? Now, I don't know if that would really organically work, but I think we do need to be thinking expansively about the different ways that we can harness telemedicine, social media, and AI even together. Yeah, no, that's that's fantastic, and it really kind of brings, I think, all the discussions uh, together. Uh, you know, uh, Justin, um, you know, I know a lot of the work um, that you do also, of course, you know, centers on the pragmatic um, implementation, um, you know, of those questions. Uh, any thoughts from that standpoint? Um, you know, you know, as we um, kind of you know think about things in this way. Yeah, I, I think uh, I, I'd love to echo what 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 John and, and Jules and Yevgeny and, and Ellie have said. Which, which is, I think, a major point actually that cuts across all of our discussion today is the technology itself is not the solution, right? It's not, it's not the thing that, that solves the issue. What it requires is the creative thinking about what is the problem that we're trying to solve? I love, Jules, your example of thinking expansively about the problems outside of our clinic walls, right? Those are where patients are also, you know, uh, seeking care and, and how do we find out what it is that they're after and how do we address it through the different tools that we have? And so th that, those are the things that, that we're working on in, in, in our group is very pragmatically understanding who are the patients who are seeking our care, utilizing tools and, and, and data-centric approaches to understand more upfront about what is it that they're after, right? So, you know, uh, uh, the triage capabilities, if we get more information, including photos, how much more can we do to get the patients to the right places and the right uh, streams of care? And understanding that the, you know, the clinical need is not just one size fits all, everybody come in for a video visit or an in-person visit. There are so many variations of the need and sort of the, the, the different uh, problems to be solved. And we should be applying different care pathways, resources, approaches to really most appropriately meet those needs. I think there's a huge um, opportunity, a lot of, a lot of um, really exciting work down the line. And I think that's gonna be the future of our field. If we can nail that, we'll be able to really um, uh, increase fulfillment from, from a care team perspective, from patient perspective, increase the efficiency of the care that we deliver and ultimately deliver better outcomes. So I think that is well within the possibility and all we have to do is know what the problems we are trying to solve, use the right tools, put them together in the right way, do great research and show you know, where we uh, fall flat and where we succeed and get better as we go. Um, so that's, I think that's the recipe for success and, and, and um, and and uh, look forward to the work. That's great. And that, that's all we have to do. So that should be that's easy. All. That's right? all. Easy. Like two weeks, two weeks, three weeks, okay. maybe we'll be, we'll be all set. Uh, Jules, uh, you, you had something else to come in on. Yeah, when Justin was talking and talking about how we look as technology is not the solution itself, it reminded me there, there's this really great Netflix show called Halt and Catch Fire about the development of personal computer and the internet. And one thing that they would say in that show was, like the computer, it's not the thing, it's the thing that gets you to the thing. 
And I think that's really true when we really need to see these as a means to an end. It's our goal is great health care for everyone. And it's not that the technology is the thing. It's just a tool to try to achieve that. And I want to really have us really think critically about even traditional ways of giving care. I tell people like, listen, you know, in a traditional doctor's visit, the doctor acts as a data collector and also as a data synthesizer and coming up with recommendations. Does the data collector and the data synthesizer have to be the same person? Do they need to be, which part needs to be physically present? Who, what is the most efficient way? Uh, you know, we also consider doctor patient relationships and other things, but really critically examining how we do things and not accepting the answer. This is how we've always done things as an acceptable reason for continuing it that way. Yeah, I love that. It's, uh, you know, because I think there are, I mean, I remember when I was back 150 years ago, when I was a resident, um, we had a, um, a visiting uh, clinician um, come in um, uh, from, um, uh, from Asia, actually, um, and was talking about, you know, the efficiency of care that we had, right? And they're like, you know, they're like, you know, listen, I could see 150 patients in the morning. And well, on the one hand, you know, there was the question of, well, you know, Patients have this expectation of the patient-doctor relationship to be a certain way. On the other hand, there's a question of access. Um, and so there are these kind of competing uh, priorities that we have uh, in terms of delivering the care. And that, that's where I think the question, which is I think the big question we're all talking about, which is what is the thing that we're delivering? And then how do we make sure that we are doing it right? And I think that's, you know, I mean, we're, we're obviously kind of all kind of adopting very much um, kind of, uh, uh, you know, startup type of lingo in terms of what we're, we're, we're talking about. But it really, I think it is appropriate here when we think about that. I just want to end on one question we had from uh, Dr. Manisha, which was, um, you know, talking about patient data privacy. Um, and obviously, I mean, we have three minutes, so we can totally address this very clearly with this panel. Uh, but, uh, you know, additional measures that we think would help ensure patient data won't be used unethically, uh, you know, obviously, not a small, not something that we can necessarily answer standing on one foot. Uh, but uh, anybody want to want to try taking that? I mean, I guess I can start. I, I don't view the telemedicine acquired data any differently than any other healthcare data. It's, it's all part of the same um, structure and should be under the HIPAA provisions. So you just, you have to continue compliance. I mean, even though this has developed rather quickly and been deployed rather quickly during, during the COVID pandemic, I think now as we're stepping back from it, we, we have to maintain compliance with all the data safety provisions that have been put in place before. Uh, I think this also creates a bit of a uh, dilemma about uh, industry largely driving telemedicine or if that ultimately uh, ends up happening. Uh, and they shouldn't be excused in any way from uh, adhering to the same standards that uh, hospitals have had to uh, for data regulation. Yeah, I think that's a great point, which is, uh, again, uh, on the one hand, uh, it's, you know, there's more opportunity uh, for that data um, to be mishandled. Uh, on the other hand, uh, what are the fundamental differences? Although, of course, as we talk about private companies becoming involved, it might um, shift things a little bit. And uh, Justin, I think you had a comment on that. Yeah, I feel like this uh, panel has, has gone too smoothly. I, I Maybe I'll, I'll throw a sort of a, an alternative view. I'll be provocative on purpose here for this perspective. I think we've trad traditionally thought about patient data as being useful for the encounter and the delivery of that care episode that, that, that is involved there, right? So, you know, taking a picture for this level of care. What if, you know, the other way to think about it, even from an ethical standpoint is, now that we have that patient data, do we not also have the responsibility to use that for greater good and for greater benefit down the line and to be able to use that to create tools that helps the patient after the patient, after the patient, right? And so is that a responsibility that we have around improvement and an innovation? And if so, how do we talk to patients about that? That's a harder discussion, right? That's, but is that also something where we think about, is that as way as highly in terms of an ethical principle as patient safety, you know, uh, uh, sort of data privacy and, and that, but just wanted to throw, throw that, that out there as an alternative. No, that's, that's a great point. And if you think about what happens, for example, in the NHS in the UK, right, where data is seen very differently, it is seen as, um, you know, it is a kind of, in a way, there's the public, um, there's a responsibility to share that data to help develop things better. How do we address that? Um, I think it's a, a critical, critical point. And John, go ahead. I'll, I'll... Okay, well, thanks. Uh, I just wanted to say that that uh, I, of course, agree with uh, uh, Yevgeny's uh, comments, but I am very heavily inclined to uh, agree with uh, Justin and his comments about, uh, you know, we have to be able to use our patients' uh, data for the greater good. And if we're going to make AI, you know, which was the first half of our webinar, 
we're just going to need that data. But we can also, you know, start thinking about have we been too, um, uh, or have we been too, how to, how to say it? Uh, I think we're, we're, we're being a bit um, too scared about, uh, about uh, sharing images, for example, because usually the images that we share or use for AI solutions are close up images and dermoscopy images, which aren't really recognizable. And I was, you know, discussed the, the, ter the term mole hackers. Do you guys know about mole hackers? Yeah, they're kind of like unicorns or leprechauns. They don't exist. You know, people don't, aren't interested in our images of moles and can't do anything with them. Uh, and you can't actually recognize a patient based on a close-up image of a mole. So let's, you know, keep it down and use the data and consider these images as anonymous, anonymized, as long as you don't have, you know, um, uh, data attached to the image uh, that's going to be um, used in any way. So, I mean, I think we we need the data and we have to use it. No, that, that's, that's a fantastic point. And I love the mole hacker analogy. And uh, Evgeny, you had one last comment. Yeah, I, I don't think that uh, data privacy precludes research, right? In fact, we've been doing research with retrospective data acquisition through all of our institutions and in many cases, multi-institutional research. I think that yes, with identifiable information like you know images or even with genetic data, we've had to kind of start thinking a little bit more about how do you protect the patients while still proceeding in this way. So, so I think that the problems are uh, already in existence and we have many ways to solve them. So I don't think that this will change anything. Great, well, I wanna thank everybody. This has been super, super fun. We could do this for another seven hours. Maybe we will, um, but I wanna just uh, a big uh, big thank you um, to uh, to all of you, um, uh, Ellie, Evgeny, uh, Justin, John, Jules. Thank you so much um, for, you know, really you've made this an amazing, amazing experience. A big shout out, by the way, and a thank you to Bobby Brinson over at Elsevier um, who handled all this coordination, all this organization. So thank you, Bobby, uh, for uh, again, doing a phenomenal job on that. Thank you everybody watching uh, now and everybody who's going to be watching later. Um, and again, reach out to any of us. Uh, we all are passionate about these subjects. Uh, and thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, again, on behalf of the journal, on behalf of JAD International, I want to say thanks so much um, for, for joining us today. And uh, everyone take care and be well. Mm -hmm.